<clears throat> okay, so uh, usually the person speaking is introduced, um, but I don't even get an introduction anymore. So uh, you're supposed to know who I am. Um, I'm going to pretend you do, and I'm just going to start. Um, so here's the fundamental fact we have to find a way to acknowledge and respond to. That at the core of our democracy, there's a whole where the framers imagined there'd be a Congress. A whole. A failed institution. A crippled and corrupted institution incapable of doing its job. Bankrupt. Not fiscally bankrupt, but politically bankrupt. Gallup's confidence rating of Congress from 1973 to today captures the sense of the public's attitude about this bankruptcy. We're now just about down to the margin of error. It could be zero people out there have confidence in our Congress. Now, if people talk about this, they typically talk about it as related to something called money in politics. Get that cute thing, politics with the dollar sign, money in politics. <clears throat> but I think it's a mistake, increasingly, I think it's a mistake to talk about it like that. I think, about, I think that's talking about it at the wrong level of generality. We need to think about the problems with democracy as focused on this institution. And the problems with this institution are not just because of money in politics. Though money shows the pattern of the problem that affects Congress generally. And to invoke a little bit of Ronald Coase, if the cause of a problem is the part of the problem that you can fix, then the truth about money is that money is the cause of the problems I'm going to describe, because the money is the part that we could fix, at least fix, most easily. Okay, now to see this, I need you to see this problem of money in politics a bit differently, and that's my objective in the next chunk here, to give you a way to think about what the problem with money in politics is that helps you see this more general problem with Congress generally. I'm going to call this section Tweedism. I wish I had a tweed coat to reinforce exactly the point I'm trying to make. The double entendre here will be obvious in a second. But to get there, we're going to start in this place. Hong Kong, which as some of you will remember, I hope, last year, year and a half ago actually, there was an extraordinary protest in Hong Kong, led by students, literally high school students, college students, some elementary school students, then their parents felt guilty that the kids were doing all the work, so they showed up too. A massive protest to protest a law proposed by the Chinese government to govern the selection of the governor, the chief executive of Hong Kong. As the law proposed, the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. So nomination of candidates by a nominating committee, a two-stage process that would identify who got to run so that the citizens would know who they had the right to vote among. This nominating committee was going to be composed of 1,200 citizens, which means out of a population of 7 million is about 0.02% of the population of Hong Kong would have the right to select the candidates that the rest of Hong Kong could vote among. Now, 0.02% is a tiny number. See there, it's a really tiny on that screen. If you think about it in relation to all the people in Hong Kong, this is what 0.02% looks like, a tiny, tiny fraction that has the right to select the candidates that the rest of Hong Kong gets to vote among. And the reason the protesters were protesting is that they believed this filter would be biased. As they put it, the 0.02% would be dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. The 99.98% would be excluded in this critical first step with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to China only. Okay, now it turns out that China didn't invent this brilliant democracy-destroying technique unless Boss Tweed was an ancient Chinese Profits, because as Boss Tweed used to say, 
quote, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. Okay, so the idea <laughs> in this genius insight is a fundamental democracy design if you look at democracies across the world today. This design, where a small set controls the effective nominating process, which then sets up choices for the public to select among. I'm gonna call that design Tweedism. Tweedism. And in Tweedism, the Tweeds select and the public elects. And that creates a filter in this process with the consequence of that filter being obviously to produce a system that's responsive to the tweeds only. So think about the system Texas had for selecting candidates to run in the uh, general election in 1923. Texas had a law. The law said that in the Democratic primary, the only party that mattered, and it's hard for you to imagine that the only party that mattered in Texas was the Democratic Party, but it's true. During a period of time in our history, Texas was dominated, as was the South, by a very different Democratic Party. The law in 1923 said the only people who could vote in the primary were whites. The all-white primary was a technique used to exclude blacks from this process of selecting candidates in the primary. They could vote in the general election if they could get registered or clear whatever hurdles there were there. But in the primary, the only vote that matters, they were excluded. So this two-stage process, an example of tweedism with the 16% of the population kicked out from this critical first step, it had the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to whites only. OK, these cases are pretty clear. I don't think there's anybody who really defends the characteristics of these democracy-denying designs. But I suggest then if they're clear, so too should this be clear. We take it for granted in the United States that campaigns will be privately funded. But we should recognize that funding is its own contest. Funding is its own primary. Funding takes time. Members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time dialing for dollars, calling people, that's a telephone in case some of you kids don't realize, <laughs> dialing for dollars, calling people across the country they've never met to raise the money they need to get back into Congress or to get their party back into power. B.F. Skinner gave us this image of the Skinner box where any stupid animal could learn which buttons it needed to push to get the sustenance it needed to survive. This is a picture of the modern American congressperson. As the modern American congressperson learns which buttons he or she must push to get the sustenance his or her campaign needs to survive, this process, this life, has an effect on these members. As they do this, they develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters. As they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not in issues 1 to 10, but in issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, you know, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> So the point is, this is a primary, too. It's the money primary. It's not a white primary. It's a green primary. It's the first stage in a two-stage process that candidates must get through to be able to be candidates that the rest of us get to vote among. So if that's the structure, we should worry a bit about who the funders are. Well, we can think first about the biggest funders. In 2014, the top 100 contributors gave as much as the bottom 4.75 million contributors. Or in the early stage of this election cycle, 158 families had given half the money by October that presidential candidates had raised. Those are the biggest funders, but I actually don't think those are the ones we should be focused on. When we think about Congress, we should thinking, be thinking about the relevant funders. Not necessarily biggest, but the people who give big enough to matter to members as they're dialing for dollars, raising the money they need to get back to Congress. So let's just pick a number. $5,200 is the amount, the maximum amount you could give in 2012 to one congressional candidate in the primary and general election. In 2012, it turns out there was 57,874 Americans who gave $5,200. 
and for the math geniuses in the room, what you're whizzing in your head is recognizing is 57,874 turns out to be 0.02% of America. 0.02% of America are the relevant funders in this first stage of this two-stage process to select the candidates who the rest of us get to vote among. This tiny fraction of the 1%. We could say this Chinese fraction of the 1%, an effectively unrepresentative fraction of the 1% dominate this first stage. That is tweetism in America today. Now what tweetism is, is corruption. Uh, but I don't mean by corruption Criminal corruption. It's not corruption predicated of members. I'm not saying individuals in Congress are engaging in criminal acts. It's corruption of a system. It's corruption of the system of representative democracy. The framers gave us not a democracy. They gave us what they called a republic, or more appropriate font, might be something like that, a republic by which they meant a, quote, representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, what they meant, as Madison explained in Federalist 52, would be a government that would have a branch that would be, quote, dependent on the people alone, alone. But our system is not dependent on the people alone. They're not quite alone, we the people. Instead, in addition to the people, there are these tweeds. Congress is dependent on the tweeds as well as the people. And of course, the interests of the tweeds are not representative sample of the interests of the people. So that's a conflicting dependence and therefore a corruption of the design the framers gave us. Now, it is, tweedism is a corruption even if it does not corrupt the voter. This election cycle has given rise to an incredible amount of non sequitur speech about this issue. People, for example, look at the race that Jeb Bush has just failed to win, where he had raised more than $110 million, now said to be wasted because he could never get more than 5% in any poll. Some people run around and say, see, that shows money doesn't matter. Money's not a problem. We don't have to worry about money. But that's fundamentally missing the point. The corruption is not in the spending of the money. The corruption is in the fundraising of the money. It's the process of raising the money that is changing the candidates. It's not the process of spending the money that's changing necessarily the voter. It's not the people, it's the politicians who are corrupted. And nothing in the history of Jeb Bush suggests that he was any less corrupted than anybody else by this process. And finally, tweetism has consequence. It affects the political process. So one way it affects the political process is that it helps to polarize Congress. Because think about the psychology of fundraising. The best way to fundraise in Congress is to vilify the other side. Chris Murphy, the youngest member of the United States Senate, senator from Connecticut, reports that when they send out emails attacking the Republicans, he's obviously a Democrat, they raise twice as much as they raise when they send out emails praising the work of the Democratic Party. And that's not because the Democratic Party is necessarily pathetic. It's true the other way around, too. So the point is this process of raising money builds a natural incentive to vilify, to further separate members of Congress. Joe Manchin, West, uh, senator from West Virginia, describes the money has infiltrated and driven us apart. It's the natural process of humans in a process where they're forced to raise money by whatever means possible. So number one, it's exacerbating the problem of polarization. Number two, it's producing an unrepresentative Congress as they are focused, as they are on this interest in raising money. Very famous Princeton study, which of course, being a Harvard professor, I'm not allowed to talk about much, so we'll put it off the stage really quickly, but a study by uh, Martin Gillens and Ben Page. Um, uh, I think Professor Gillens' daughter is here, not necessarily here, but she's here at the law school. But anyway, this is an amazingly important study um, where this perhaps the largest empirical study of actual decisions by our government 
um, in the uh, uh, past 40 years, relating the actual decisions of our government to the attitudes of the economic elite, the attitudes of the organized interest groups, and the attitudes of the average voter. And what they find with respect to the economic elite is that the, as the percentage of economic elite who supports something goes from 0% to 100%, the probability of that thing being enacted goes up. That's intuitive. That's the way it should be. The more who support an idea, the more likely it is it gets passed. Same thing with organized interest groups. The more who support an idea, the more likely it is it will get passed. Oops, I guess I should show you that graph. There it is. Um, and then finally, here's the graph of the average citizen. It's a flat line, as you can see, literally and figuratively. What this is saying is, as the percentage of average voters support something, supporting something goes up from 0% to 100%, it doesn't change the probability of that thing being enacted. There is no statistically significant connection between what the average voter thinks and what we do. It's only if the average voter happens to agree with what the elite or organized interest groups want that that thing actually gets done. As they put it when they describe it in English, when the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy in a democracy. Right, this is the picture you were taught in elementary school of our democracy, right? There we are, that's kind of middle America there, driving the bus. We are supposed to be driving the bus. Here's the reality of our democracy. The steering wheel has come removed <laughs> from the bus. We're no longer driving the bus. The drive bus is being driven for us in this democracy. And then finally, point number three. What this tweetism yields is increasingly distracted political elites. And what that yields is an increasingly angry and frustrated democracy. Because as they are distracted by the money, Republicans and Democrats alike. So for example, Paul Krugman in August wrote about the fact that the candidates for president in the Republican primary we're talking about ideas for reforming Social Security that the base of the Republican Party did not like. And he was puzzled about that, as he put it. What's puzzling about the renewed Republican assault on Social Security is that it looks like bad politics as well as bad policy. Americans love Social Security, so why aren't the candidates at least pretending to share that sentiment? And the obvious answer is, that it's all about the big money because the suppliers of the big money in the Republican primary do want Social Security fundamentally changed. So the candidates are bending towards what the funders would want and not what the voters would want. Or then just a couple weeks ago, he did the same thing um, February 22nd, talking about, talking about Marco Rubio. He says, in short, Marco Rubio is peddling crank economics. What's interesting, however, is why. You see, he's not pandering to ignorant voters. He's pandering to an ignorant elite. So when Mr. Rubio genuflects at the altars of supply-side economics and hard money, he isn't telling ordinary Republicans what they want to hear. By and large, the party's base couldn't care less. He is instead pandering to the party's elite, consisting mainly of big donors and the network of apparatchiks and think, at think tanks, media organizations, and so on. So the point again is that the candidate bends to the funders, the elites, and ignores the base. The same point can be made the other way around. Think about the increasing criticism of Secretary Clinton's relationship to big banks and payments from big banks, signaling an attention to the interests of big banks that frustrates the base of the Democratic Party. In both cases, this reality alienates the base. And that alienation creates a condition which is ripe for the rise of people like Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, even if Bernie's fallen back just a bit. Okay, so this is the story of tweedism. We've allowed a system to evolve that allows a tiny fraction extraordinary power in the political process. And the consequence that, of that is a system that is not responsive, not representative, and increasingly frustrated democratic base. Now, if you think about why that works like that, 
and generalize it a bit. We can recognize that this polarization, this dysfunction, the pathologies here are a byproduct of a core feature dash bug of the current system. It is its unrepresentativeness. And its unrepresentativeness is caused not just by money and politics, but it's caused also by other features slash bugs of the current design of our political process. So think about safe seat gerrymanderingism. It's too big to fit on the screen, but let's say gerryism. It's a great piece by Christopher Ingram in the uh, Washington Post uh, referring to the crimes against geography which define the current way that we architect districts in the House of Representatives. Crafting districts, of course, that's not a community that that district is representing. That's a design to make it possible for that representative to have a safe seat. But the consequence of safe seats are representatives who are less responsive to a full range of interests in a particular district. So in the 435 seats in the House of Representatives right now, at most 90, that's probably 50 according to um, uh, those who've studied this more recently, but maybe 90 of these seats are competitive. Meaning in only 90 seats, does the incumbent have a chance of being thrown out by the other party? So that means in 345 seats, if you're a Republican in a safe Democratic seat or a Democrat in a safe Republican seat, your representative doesn't care about you because there's no chance that your views will matter to the outcome of the election. The only thing your representative is concerned about is somebody from his or her own party who might decide to challenge that representative. That person's a real threat, so there's lots of attention to the extremes on the right or the extremes on the left, but not to the unrepresentative citizen in the middle. And what that means is that there are 89 million Americans who are effectively unrepresented in our system right now by the House of Representatives because we've designed a system for representativeness that destroys their possible opportunity to matter. They are unrepresentative. And that's a feature, that's a way in which the system is unrepresentative. It's also caused by the unequal freedom to vote that we've allowed to evolve inside of our system. The Brennan Center did a study of the 2014 election um, uh, um, process and found this extraordinary development of long lines across the country in uh, context of voting. We found uh, more than 10 million Americans had to wait at least 30 minutes to vote. And of course, that correlated directly with the race of the district, um, which of course is an indirect proxy for the party represented by a district. So that meant that if you are African American, you are much more likely to have to wait to vote than if you are white. Now, if you are a middle class or upper middle class person with childcare and an iPhone, you might think, okay, what's a half an hour gonna matter? It's okay for those people to have to suffer that kind of wait. But for others, this idea of waiting when you don't have childcare, when you've got two jobs, when you can't afford to hang out just for the chance to vote, is effectively a poll tax, which working Americans increasingly cannot afford. And it's no accident. The striking thing about the Brennan study was that they looked at Ohio, which received $3 billion in funding after the 20, uh, 2004 election to upgrade their systems. And what they found was in African American districts, the upgrade was a downgrade. And in white districts, the upgrade was an upgrade, which means this is self-consciously designed to increase the burden on some people to vote outrageously in a system intended to produce representative democracy. All three of these features defeat the idea of representative democracy, the idea at the core of what a republic needs. And all three need fundamental reform if we're gonna get close to the idea of what a republic is supposed to be. So what would reform look like? Well, the core thing to recognize about the problem of our democracy is that the problem is an expression of inequality. I don't mean inequality of wealth. 
Though, of course, the inequality I mean contributes to the inequality of wealth. I mean the inequality of citizens, the inequality of citizens in a democracy that doesn't give citizens equal power in the political process, regardless of the equality of wealth. And the solution to that inequality is obviously to try to produce equality in the political system, the equality of citizens inside the political system, a system where all were to be, the system was to be dependent on the people alone, which just to be clear, as Madison put it in Federalist 57, by the people, he meant, quote, not the rich more than the poor. Yet, of course, the system we have right now is a system intended to give the rich more power than the poor. So how would we solve that? How would you create this idea of equality of citizens? Well, technically, you could say, what would it take to solve it? And strikingly, all it would take is a statute. All it would take is a statute to, in my view, solve 85% of the problem. Um, let's call it the Citizen Equality Act. So the Citizen Equality Act will have three parts. First, it will change the way campaigns are funded. So that instead of this highly concentrated, large dollar funding system, we produce bottom-up public funding of elections, either through vouchers or matching funds. In my book, uh, Republic Loss, I describe a $50 voucher. Um, Richard Painter, who some of you I know um, have seen and, and read this book, um, he's a conservative who was the ethics czar in the Bush administration, describes the system for a $200 voucher. So the point is, every voter gets a voucher which they get to use to fund campaigns of congressional candidates they support. And what that does is change the business model of fundraising. You're no longer focused on the large money, you're focused on money from everybody. And proposals like the American Anti-Corruption Act or John Sarbanes' Governed by the People Act are driven by precisely this idea, bottom-up public funding that creates a wide diversity of people funding campaigns instead of the concentrated tiny fraction of tweeds who fund campaigns now. That's point one. Point two of the Citizen Equality Act is to try to create equal representation. So Fair Vote and uh, this great book by Mark, uh, Michael Golden, Unlock Congress, describe a system which obviously Lonnie Guineer has talked about something similar to this for a long time, of uh, producing in the House of Representatives multi-member districts like the framers had, with ranked choice voting. So that a district might have five representatives, and with ranked choice voting, you rank your preferences, which means that minority groups within that district, I don't mean racially minority, I mean political minority groups too, would have a shot at electing representatives regard, so long as they represent anywhere above 10 to 15% of members in that district. With this would produce effectively in the House of Representatives proportional representation, which means we would have a House of Representatives that actually represents America, that looks like America, that looks like the diversity of America, where there are conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans, where there's a mix that isn't this extreme polarization that's produced in part by the way We've crafted the rules for selecting Congress. And what most people don't recognize is that the Constitution explicitly gives Congress the power to do this independent of what the states might decide to do when the states district their own state legislative districts. Congress has the power tomorrow to change the way these districts are drawn. And then finally, changes to bring about equal freedom to vote. Um, the Voting Rights uh, Advancement Act of 2015, which tries to get over some of the problems created by the Supreme Court in, in interpreting um, earlier Voting Rights Protection Acts, Bernie Sanders' Democracy Day, all techniques for making the barriers to voting lower so that all of us get to participate um, equally in the process of voting. All three of these need to be pursued together. This is the critical point that we're not talking about simply reforms of money. We're talking about a reform to produce, as the president puts it, a better politics. And indeed, what was striking about his State of the Union was that for the first time, the president was identifying the package and not just the single ideas. I'm going to give you one minute of this address. And I'm addressing the American people now. If we want a better politics, it's not enough just to change a congressman or change a senator or even change a president. We have to change the system to reflect our better selves. 
I think we've got to end the practice of drawing our congressional districts so that politicians can pick their voters and not the other way around. Let a bipartisan group do it. I believe we've got to reduce the influence of money in our politics so that a handful of families or hidden interests can bankroll our elections. And if our existing approach to campaign finance reform can't pass muster in the courts, we need to work together to find a real solution, because it's a problem. And most of you don't like raising money. I know. I've done it. We've got to make it easier to vote, not harder. We need to modernize it for the way we live now. So, of course, after he said this, all of the groups that are interested in these separate movements identified the greatness of the president talking about changing the way campaigns are funded, or talking about changing the way districts are drawn, or talked about changing the ease with which people get to vote. But the point is, it's not these three separately. What's important about what he has identified is the idea of a democracy movement thinking generally about how to restore the core idea of a representative democracy, which is equality. So that's how you would do it technically. But the challenge here is not technical. The challenge is political. Because the real problem, a problem which I've become incredibly sensitive to, is who is it within our political system who's going to bring about such a change? What entity? Right? It's not going to be the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court doesn't have the power to order public funding of elections. It's not going to be Congress. Congress focused in this two-year election cycle does not have time to think about how to change the institution from the moment of an election. They start raising money for the next election. They're not going to be changing the rules. They're going to be focused on how to win according to the existing rules. George Mason, at the Constitutional Convention, at the Constitutional Convention um, two days before the Constitution was published, had an idea. He noticed that the only ways to amend the Constitution then in the draft of the Constitution were for Congress to amend the Constitution. And he said, well, what if Congress is the problem? He said, no amendments of the proper kind would ever be obtained by the people if the government should become oppressive. That led to the framers putting the convention clause in the Constitution to give the states the power to call on Congress to convene a convention for the purpose of proposing amendments a process Congress couldn't control. But the politics around the convention process right now have become so uh, vicious that I think it's incredibly unlikely we're going to see a cross-partisan convention that would have the opportunity to address these problems. So what about a president? Well, the key to recognize is that an ordinary president, and I don't mean like a, mod a medium, like talented president. I mean just a normal president. You know, The ordinary model of being president is not going to take this problem on. Because to take on this problem is to take on Congress, and to take on Congress is to take on your own party, and to take on your own party is to guarantee you'll get nothing done, and to get nothing done is to guarantee you'll be a one-term president, which is to mean you are a failed president. No normal president will take this on, because presidents depend upon Congress. And even in the process of running for president, you depend heavily on the existing Congress, because to become credible as a candidate is about rallying allies from the existing Congress to your side, unless you're a billionaire or a, um, a carnival barker or something like that. Um, and that process itself is not going to happen if your whole focus is the failure of Congress. So that let me think, well, what if we could have a referendum? We know from polls, if we had a referendum for these changes, America would vote for these changes. Of course, we don't have a referendum power. Uh, probably a good thing we don't, but there it is. We don't have a referendum power, so we don't have the opportunity for a referendum directly. So that led me to think, well, what if we had a different kind of referendum, kind of referendum president who said, look, my one purpose is to make these changes. I guarantee this is what I will do. And so you know that if you elect me, this will happen um, if there's any hope of it happening at all. Well, it turned out that wasn't a terribly effective strategy either. <laughs> but 
But you know, in the middle of hearing everybody tell me how stupid a strategy this was, you know, obviously this couldn't work, the phrase that kept on coming back to my head was a phrase first uttered by the great John Snow. So here's that phrase. You're right. It's a bad plan. What's your plan? See, because that's the question. <laughs> you know, what's your plan? <laughs> I mean, we don't have the option of not fixing this. If we don't fix this, then we're screwed. You're screwed, more particularly, not my generation. Like all the problems we face, I'm going to be dead long before they're real problems. But you, you face these problems, climate change, a healthcare system we can't afford, jobs that are not growing. All of these are problems you bear. And if we don't solve it with this plan, what is the plan? What's the way? What's the strategy? Because it's just possible that we found ourselves in the middle of a constitutional republic that doesn't have the means to save itself. Unless one of you comes up with a genius way around it. Okay, that's all I'll say. Happy to take questions or abuse or whatever else you'd like to give. But thank you very much. So there are mics. Um, raise your hand and I'll give you a mic. Hi, my name is Steve Salcedo. I'm a 3L here. Do you think that uh, a better strategy is to focus on reforming the national election system or would it somehow be more effective to focus on cities and states? Well, so I am incredibly supportive of all the great work being done locally. But here's my skepticism about that strategy. Number one, we don't have 20 years to solve this problem. You know, we're not going to pass climate change legislation until we solve this problem. We're not going to get affordable health care for everybody until we solve this problem. The idea of taking on Wall Street before we tell solve this problem is crazy talk, right? All of the fantasy politics you see when you see debates on television between presidential candidates is fantasy politics until we solve this problem. We can't wait for 20 years to solve this problem. That's point number one. But here's the more troubling point. I actually think there's a difference with the problem of Congress and the problem at many state legislatures. You know, I think California and New York and Illinois are basically like Congress. So I'd love to see public funding in all of those contexts. But what I worry about is that, you know, if you go to Vermont and you get the Vermont legislature to pass public funding, and those Vermont legislators then get elected with public funding, I fear people in Vermont will look at the Vermont legislature and say, I don't really see much difference here. And so when they don't see much difference there, they then say, I'm not sure public funding has actually done anything for us. So then when we say to them, support public funding at the federal level, they'll say, why? It doesn't seem to matter much. And the point is, it might not matter much in a relatively well-functioning democracy, which many state governments, small state governments are. So I worry that we divert so much of our energy to a solution that in the long run might weaken the opportunity for the solution we need at the federal level. And those two things together say, you know, people have to work on what they want to work on, but I, have to, I want to work on solving the problem of Congress. Hand right there. Democracy Spring is organizing. They said they have 4,500 people pledged to sit in at the Capitol. And I had pledged, and they called me, and they said, are you ready to get arrested for this? And I, I was thinking, well, I've never been arrested before, and I don't like you know, the style of protesting with getting arrested at the Capitol. But do you think we should bring a bunch of HLS people down there and do that? Or do you think that's not a worthwhile initiative? Well, so I'm going to be part of the marchers. Um, I teach four days a week, so I can't hang out there. But I'm going to go down to the weekends to march. To, it's a march from Philadelphia to Washington. And then I'm going to show up and, and be as part of the presence that they are placing in front of the Capitol. And if the Capitol police are stupid, we will get arrested. But you know that's stupidity. I don't think that's, you know. So I, I intend to exercise the rights, which I think we all have, to make Congress address this issue directly. And so I'm a big supporter of Democracy Spring, and I want Democracy Spring to help kick off this movement to focus us beyond the candidates running for president to the really core change that we've got to have. Because I think we get so distracted by this fight for the presidents that we miss 
The real change has got to be a change about Congress, not the president. And that's exactly what Democracy Spring and uh, then the next, there's another democracy, some democracy awakening that happens just after Democracy Spring has happened in April as well. Uh, I'm curious what you think. Uh, I guess maybe one part of the presentation that we didn't hear too much about is the voters. And I think, particularly on the Republican side, I can't remember who coined it, maybe Ron Brownstein or someone said that basically the Republican Party's at kind of a post policy moment to the point where voters aren't really responding to policies. Like you were mentioning with Krugman and Rubio on Social Security, they're responding to attitudinal stuff, um, you know, emotion, anger. Yeah. I'm curious where, you know, I assume that's related to this. I can't quite place exactly how. Yeah, I, I, it's, that's directly the section um, that you pointed to that I think explains the relationship, where you see an angry and frustrated public because they look at a government that they don't think is responding to them, and we can show them it's not responding to them. Right? The combination of the uh, Page and Gillen's study and this presidential election together is a clear demonstration of how people look at this process and say, this just isn't working. So, you know, I know people sneer Donald Trump supporters, and I am violently opposed to Donald Trump becoming president because of his crazy talk in a million directions. But one of the biggest reasons he is loved on the right by the base of the Republican Party is because people think this guy is not bought and can't be bought. And I'm willing to accept insanity if I could get a president who's not bought. Now, that should be telling us something. It should be telling us that, boy, if we had uh, you know, other politicians who the public thought were not bought, um, we'd begin to change people's relationship to politics. Now, Donald Trump's only solution to this problem is to elect billionaires. You know, and my view is we fought a revolution against that idea. That's why we gave up aristocracy. And we're supposed to have a system where you don't have to be a billionaire to run for president and certainly to run for Congress. So the only way to solve this problem, really, is to change the way we fund elections, to have public funding of elections. And the cost of doing that is trivial compared to the immediate benefit that you would get by doing something like that. So what we need are politicians willing to talk about the real solution and to make that happen. Uh, hi. Is this on? Yep. Uh, you mentioned democracy vouchers in your presentation. How do you respond to the criticism of democracy vouchers that essentially says, while they might change the temporality of the current nominating process, they don't fundamentally alter the current nominating process? Because in post-Citizens United world, with unlimited independent expenditures by super PACs, the super PACs are just going to spend their money to uh, select the candidates that to succeed in the voucher process as opposed to later in the actual primary nominating process. Yeah. So um, y y one striking thing about this presentation is you didn't see the word Citizens United anywhere. right? Um, and that's intentionally because I think that we are um, being, con we're being mis misdirected by this, by this fear around Citizens United and Super PACs. Not because I don't think it's a problem. I think Super PACs are a serious, serious pathological problem inside of our democracy but because I think it's going to be solved um, long before we get a constitutional amendment. You know, for law geeks, this is clearer, and you know, some of us are law geeks, right? But the point is, um, Citizens United established the constitutional right to spend unlimited amounts of money. The DC Circuit turned that into the constitutional right to give unlimited amounts of money. The one doesn't follow from the other. The Supreme Court never reviewed Speech Now, the case that made that, uh, made that move. So the Supreme Court has the means to stand by Citizens United and reverse the super PACs. Uh, and they have the motive, because all but one or two of those justices look at what they have wrought and think, this is a disaster. Uh, and there is now litigation working through by public interest lit litigants to set up the case to get it to the court so the court can finally say, look, you didn't mean to say super PACs. What you meant to say was, you know, people can spend unlimited amounts of money. And if, would that be a terrible thing? Well, if it's transparent, which of course it's not yet because of stupid IRS rules that have not been yet fixed, if it were transparent, it's not that I like that system. But I'm not sure it would be, sure be disastrous, because the prediction that many of us made after Citizens United, that you'd see billions of dollars being spent by corporations, 
at least so long as there was super PACs, turned out to be false. Corporations don't spend money in politics because they've discovered the high cost of free speech. If they start supporting political candidates, like Target did when it supported the anti-gay candidate for governor in Minnesota, they find their stores picketed across the country. So they don't want that. So what they find, what they want is a way to indirectly support, and that's what super PACs are. But I actually think we'll be able to solve the super PACs. So yes, we've got to solve that problem too. But we've got to stop thinking that we solve the problems of American democracy by appealing to five justices on the Supreme Court. We've got to recognize the only way we're going to solve the problems of American democracy is to build a democratic movement to demand democracy again. And once we do that, you know, the history of the Supreme Court is it never lives in la la land for long, and they will come around to giving us a constitution that accords with these values. So that's why my movement, the movements I want to participate in, are about building a democratic movement to bring democratic change with a small d and leave it to the lawyers and the Brennan Center, great lawyers, to litigate the strategy in the Supreme Court to get the Supreme Court to reflect what the democracy has demanded. Hi. Um, I wondered if you could comment on the extent to which the US has become like a two-party state in that the Democrats and the Republicans seem to work together to pass legislation and that keeps out other parties. So I think in, in your personal case, you couldn't get on the ticket for the Democrat debate because it was up to the Democrats who was going to go on telly. Um, so, and if you look at things like saw loser laws, where if you stand in the primary for one party and you lose, you can't then stand as an independent, arguably, the, the two parties have, have sort of dug their way in, and I'm personally struggling to see if there's a way they can dig their way back out. And the more that attention is paid to primaries being like a part of the election process, the problem then is that somewhere the government needs to define what a political party is, and the people who offer up the... Yeah definitions are the people that stand to benefit. Yeah, so I completely agree with you. We've got an overly entrenched duopoly. In, and, uh, um, and so the question is, what's the strategy to bring about a change? One strategy is to just take it on directly. I don't think that has a chance to work. Um, you know, when they try, when um, Americans elect tried to create an alternative path to becoming a nominee to the president, they spent $54 million and they didn't get on the ballot in every state. Right? Um, now, they thought they were going to get to be on the ballot in every state, but it was going to cost unbelievable amounts of money to create an infrastructure to get a candidate on the ballot in every state that was independent of the parties. Um, but if you begin to change the way campaigns are funded, then you have a real opportunity to begin to fund alternative parties at the local level. Now, you know, this is one of the strongest criticisms of what I've said. People say, oh my gosh, you're going to create the Israeli parliament. If you have, if you have um, uh, uh, proportional representation and public funding, um, those two things together will make it so anybody can create a party and anybody can um, you know, begin to be a faction inside of, of the government. And, and my view is I'm not a fan of multi, you know, 500 party parliaments, but I am a fan of parliaments that encourage a wider range of people to participate. And right now, we don't do that. Because the only people who have a shot to participate are those who have a Rolodex, that's an old technology for finding telephone numbers, big enough to raise the million or two million dollars you need to be able to run a campaign. So that means you know, real diversity in the political process is shut out on day one. So I'm with you as to the objective, and I think I'm providing a means to get to the objective, but I'm happy to talk about other techniques too. Um, a two-part question. Could you, one, could you perhaps speculate about the possibility of the three specific areas of reform you were talking about uh, getting into the presidential debate this fall? If, um, and the other question is, um, assuming that as I, uh, including the, along with The Economist, uh, uh, optimistically hope, assuming Donald Trump causes us to have a Democratic Senate, uh, 
Is there any chance that some of these reforms might get strongly, effectively pursued in a democratic Senate? Well, so my view has been that the only way we get these reforms to happen is if the candidates for president talk about the reforms. Now, on the Democratic side, um, Bernie's been very good at talking about the problem. You can't hear him speak without him talking about the problem of money in politics and the billionaires and the Wall Street money. And geez, did you know? Did you know I'm not raising any money except from small dollar contributions? That's the Bernie line. So nobody can miss that. But when you ask a typical Bernie support, uh, Sanders supporter, so what's he going to do in the first 100 days? Most don't have any clue. And when you ask Bernie what he's going to do in the first 100 days, he identifies you know, transparency regs he's going to get through. Um, he's going to be supportive of the idea of amending the Constitution, which, as law geeks you know, is an incredibly hard thing to even imagine. And he says that in the long term, he's willing to talk about public funding of elections. To which my response is, in the long term? What are you going to do in the short term, Bernie? Because here's no change that you're talking about possible until you change the way we fund elections. So I don't think that campaign has yet made the answers a central part of the debate. And Hillary Clinton, I think, you know, Hillary Clinton's platform about this is great. Great. I mean, she has identified exactly the solutions we want. But you will never see her talk about it. Because any time she talks about the corrupting influence of money in politics, she's immediately stung by all the stuff around her foundation and the Goldman Sachs money. And so she's blocked from talking about the problem, even though she has the solutions. And Bernie talks about the problem, but he's not even willing to talk about the need, as Elizabeth Warren says, to on day one press for changing the way we fund elections. So that means I'm not hopeful. Now, on the Republican side, you know, again, who knows what Donald Trump is going to talk about. Um, and even if he talks about it on one day, he's going to say the opposite on the next day. He hasn't yet identified any policy reforms about this. I actually tried to figure out who in his campaign to talk to about it. Um, and the report I got back from the campaign was there are zero policy people in the Donald Trump campaign. <laughs> You know, that is just, uh, this is the most scary thing about this whole fact, right? It's not that it's just this clown out there. It's this clown with nobody else. There's nobody behind the curtain. Like, this is not Wizard of Oz, right? Um, so I don't think there's much chance on that side either. So that's why, you know, I and many others are trying whatever way we can to get this into the center of the debate. And that's the hopefulness about the Democracy Spring movement, because Democracy Spring is all about making the reforms the central part of the conversation. Hi, um, I don't, is this working? Can you hear? Yeah, okay. I'm curious, you've sort of framed your talk in terms of returning to our, you know, original ideas of democracy. And I'm curious, given that we know that the system as it was created was never meant to represent anyone but landowning white men, sort of why you frame it as a return to this ideal as opposed to talking about more of a revolutionary idea of what democracy could be. Yeah, so I am a representative democracy person. And I certainly agree with you that the framers did not create a representative democracy the way we think of what it should include. Excluded women, excluded African Americans. Um, we could have an interesting argument about what the purpose of the property restriction was. It turned out something like 96% of white males qualified under the property restriction. And at least if you listen to the justifications for the property restriction, it wasn't about reinforcing aristocracy. It was about weakening the, tend, the tendency to aristocracy. Because the argument was, if people who have no property can vote, it's easier to buy their votes. So you don't want to give the rich an easy way to buy votes. So the only people who should vote are people who are properly independent. And the people who are independent are the property owners. Now, I don't agree with that. But I, what I'm saying is I don't think it's actually animated by a design to create an aristocracy. They were trying to create a not aristocracy. They were trying to negate what they had before. They failed from our perspective, but the ideals they had are ideals that I think we should celebrate. We should say, not restore a representative democracy. We should say, let's try a representative democracy. We've never had it, so let's give it a run. Let's see what happens with 50 years of representative democracy. Let's see how it works for our people. Because I actually think it's better than direct democracy models. I think the 
popular, the progressives were mistaken in lots of ways about how direct democracy would be corrupted by the same influences which they were fighting against. So, so I'd like to find a way of talking about it. Now, why do that in America? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, foreigners are always puzzled about this, but we live in an extremely reverential constitutional culture. And it is, I think, really important resource for us to be able to go back to the framers and show that the framers were egalitarians about citizenship, right? Not, again, in the, race, in the context that you're, you and I would be talking about, but at least in the place that they thought were relevant citizens, they were egalitarians, not the rich more than the poor. The striking thing about our current politi- uh, political, um, Supreme Court jurisprudence is that when you think about equality, You think about race equality, which the framers didn't care about. You think about sex equality, which the framers didn't care about. You think of sexual orientation equality, which the framers didn't even know about. Um, But if you stand up in our Supreme Court and you start talking about egalitarianism as to wealth, the Supreme Court thinks you've disqualified yourself to talk about American constitutionalism. They think that that is a completely un- a justifiable basis to think about how to set up uh, election law. But my point is, that was the only equality they cared about. That was the one, not the rich more than the poor. And so I think that's a resource for us to say, look, you're missing something really important about what a republic is supposed to be. You love, you conservatives love to say, we don't have a democracy. You're right, we have a republic. We have a representative democracy, which at its core means equal citizens. That's what it's supposed to mean. And they weren't so great at it. We're not so great at it equal either. Look, you know, you have the experience of looking at your parents and saying to your parents, how could you possibly have thought blah, blah, blah? But you say that, right? Because that's what young kids do. Your kids will say the same thing to you about something that right now you can't imagine politics ever doing. Like, for example, why don't we allow 14-year-olds to vote in America? I mean, you know, they're burdened by all of these decisions of our government. But you know, it's as crazy to talk about 14-year-olds voting in America today as it was to talk about women voting in America in 1820. Right? But you know, I hope children and dolphins will eventually get to vote. Like That's where I, I'm a deep egalitarian, all the way down. Um, so I think we have a reason to grab the ideal and to fight for the ideal. And it's a rhetorically powerful tool inside of our constitutional democracy. Is that our last question? It was a good question. That could be our last question. I mean, okay, great. That's our last question. Thanks very much.